Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to start a new topic. Um, it's about elementary particles, which are basically some construction blocks from which atoms are um, created. Um, now, and this is the first lecture uh, in this topic. It's called Main Particles. Now, um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. There is another course, by the way, on this website, Math for Teens. It's a prerequisite. So, whether you take the course uh, Math for Teens or not, but you have to know what's in it, because the physics without math is nothing. Now, the site is uh, completely free. There are no advertisements, no strings attached. You don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Now, there is some functionality which is related to signing in, but that's beyond the point. It's all explained in some introductory um, articles on the website. Um, now, the uh, course on the website is basically organized in a series of hierarchical menus. Now, each lecture has a textual supplement, which is basically like a textbook. There are problems solved, there are exams, which you can take as many times as you want um, until you will get perfect scores. So I do suggest you to use the website rather than, let's say, YouTube channel or anything else where you can find this lecture. So, <coughs> main particles. Well, the history of physics is basically digging deeper and deeper into the structure of the matter. Well, in some way. Um, now, first of all, people have discovered molecules which basically retain certain property, chemical properties and physical properties of, of, of matter. Then they found out that um, molecules are actually compositions of atoms. Well, then they started digging the atoms. Um, and three main particles actually were, well, in the beginning of this process of discovery, what is atom. Um, it's electrons, protons, and neutrons. Now, a couple of words about these particles. Well, first of all, they are kind of main particles, because they are main building blocks of matter. There are many other particles, and there is a whole uh, story about how we can put them into some kind of a nice theory, structure, whatever. And we will talk about uh, certain structures. But in any case, these three, which I will talk about today, electrons, protons, and neutrons, are still considered to be the main uh, particles, main elementary particles. Now, are they the end of the way, the end of the road, uh, and there is nothing inside these main particles? Well, apparently there are certain other theories and experiments that um, basically show that might be not. It's not as conclusive, I would say, as the existence of these three main particles is kind of conclusive. Uh, but their inner structure, well, uh, again, I, I don't want to talk about this right now. I will probably spend some time basically explaining what's the theory behind structure of these elementary particles. Um, uh, so today we will talk about just these three. Now, basically whatever I'm um, discussing right now uh, is already kind of touched in different places in the previous lectures. Um, well, maybe just very briefly. Electrons were um, discovered in experiments by Thompson in, uh, at the end of the 19th century. Basically it's um, cathode tube, so to speak. So you have a tube, you have plus and minus uh, 
uh, contact inside the tubes. And uh, the problem is that the, uh, let's say, if cathode is hot, for example, then we know right now that it emits electrons. Well, he didn't know that, but he did understand that there is a current which is going through this um, circuit because electrons from the negative um, end of this uh, of this tube are emitted because it's a hot cathode and they are going into the positive uh, end of the tube. Now, the problem is that if you have certain um, different shapes of, uh, of the positive side, side side and if you have something like electrostatic field around it then the cathode ray is actually deviated and because he detected this type of deviation he concluded that there are some material particles which are carried this negative um, charge and that's basically the beginning how the electrons were actually discovered. <coughs> now, speaking about protons, that was a little differently. And there are many people actually who did some experiments which contributed to discovery of the protons. And uh, obviously, subsequent discoveries were using something which has already been discovered before. Um, well, probably one of the, um, I would say, decisive points was um, also a tube with some gas. Um, um, the gas can be different, can be um, helium, can be hydrogen, can be neon, I mean different gases, they were experimenting. Now, what they did was they put the cathode but with holes. This is a cathode which is mi which is minus. Now this is plus. Now here they put some fluorescent material. And what's interesting is that when with the high voltage, well they have already kind of known that electrons are basically going this way. However, what happened was that this um, luminescent uh, um, kind of uh, cover or whatever it is, um, material, started uh, emitting light. So they have suggested that probably um, electrons, as they're coming to this, um, hit the molecules or atoms of gas, whether it's hydrogen or helium or something like this. And what happened, um, now the atom is neutral, so basically the electrons, as they're coming here, they hit the atoms of, of the gas. And um, after that, certain electrons were basically kicked out of these atoms and also go to the positive uh, end, of the, uh, end of the tube. What remains was the positive, since electrons were this way, what remains in the atoms of this gas, the positive part. And the positive part was gravitating towards negative end of the tube. But since there are holes, some of them went through and lit the luminescent material. So there are some positive um, particles <coughs> as a result of this bombardment of the gas. Now, these positive particles were different for different gases because they can just detect certain um, amount of luminosity. Um, also, if you put something like an electrostatic field around this part of the tube, um, then you would uh, change the direction of these uh, positive particles. So, 
the combination of this and some other experiments actually came to conclusion that there are these positive particles. Now, um, then there was a um, planetary uh, model of the atom of Rutherford, then Bohr came into um, Bohr's model, which is kind of enhancement of the Rutherford. We did talk about this before. And uh, Ruther Rutherford experiments proved that the positive uh, side, which is in the nucleus, and uh, the atom is practically empty because he was experimenting with gold foil. We were talking about this before. Um, and uh, the uh, particles went just through the atoms. Um, now, what is interesting is there was experiments with um, uh, which, which proved the existence of neutron. Now, this was done in 1930s by Chadwick, um, the English-British uh, physicist. So, his experiments were um, he was bombarding beryllium with certain, well, rays which are coming from uh, radioactive material. I think he was using polonium. And as a result, he basically saw that the uh, particles which were emitted by radioactive polonium bombarded beryllium and kick out of, from, from beryllium something, some particles, material particles, which he has detected, but they were neutrally charged. It's not positive, it's not negative. So he came to a conclusion that there is some other particle, and he called it neut neutron. Now, um, what's also interesting is that um, experiments show that atom is practically empty, so to speak. Um, the size of the atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters. Well, I, I put this order off, which means it can be you know, 1.0 uh, or can be 5.0 times this multiplier. But anyway, it's some kind of a a uh, relatively small multiplier, let's say from 1 to 9, something like this, times 10 to the minus 10 uh, meters. Whereas the nucleus has 10 to the minus 15 meters. So the size of the nucleus is five orders of magnitude. Five orders of magnitude is 100,000. So the nucleus is five uh, is about, well, not necessarily, I mean, different nucleus have different ratio. Some of them have 20,000, some of them have, hun have, have 100,000, but it's significantly smaller than the size of the entire atom. So that's why atom is practically empty. At the same time, the mass of the atom is basically concentrated in the nucleus. Nucleus has something like 99.9% of the mass. So electrons are very, very light and all the mass is in nucleus. Now, um, it was later discovered that neutrons and protons are well, about the same um, w weight and size. The difference is something like one-tenth of one percent, something like this. But neutrons are neutral and protons are positive. Now, number of protons is equal to number of electrons to keep the atom neutral and it's called atomic number z number of neutrons which is usually uh, letter a now their sum is atomic mass um, now what we we have learned before that chemical properties depend on electrons, how they are organized into shells and subshells. And you remember we were talking about some chemical reactions in the previous lectures. So um, number of protons and number of electrons is the same and they determine. So Z, the atomic number, determines chemical properties of the uh, of, of atom. 
So, what about n? Can we have different number of neutrons for the same number of protons? Answer is yes. Now, there are so-called isotopes of the same material, like, for example, uh, hydrogen um, has, generally speaking, only one proton uh, in the nucleus, but it has isotope with one neutron, so proton and neutron, and it has another isotope um, with two neutrons per one proton, obviously. So it's the deuterium and tritium, they're called. And many different elements have their isotopes. For example, uranium has two known uh, uh, isotopes, uranium-235, that's the mass, that's A-235, and there is a 238, where Z is the same thing. I don't remember exactly, maybe it's 92. So it's a different number of neutrons. Now, here is um, more, I would say, physical aspect of this. Obviously, electrons are um, surrounding the, uh, the nucleus, and they're not flying, not freely flying away. I mean, sometimes they do, but generally speaking, the, the atom is, 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 is holding itself. Now, why? Well, the protons are positive, uh, electrons are negative. They are surrounding on some orbits, and uh, their mutual attraction, positive and negative, keeps electrons on their orbits. Now, the protons among themselves in the nucleus, they are all positive, which means they repel each other. So what keeps the nucleus together? Okay, I think I mentioned it once, but I'll mention it again. There are certain forces in nature which are, number one, act on a very, very short distance, the distance of the size of the nucleus. Number two, they are much stronger than electrostatic forces of repelling. So these strong, or the, uh, strong is the name, by the way, strong forces, or nuclear forces. So these forces actually keep uh, protons together. So electrostatic forces are trying to repel protons and destroy the nucleus. The um, strong nuclear forces, they're keeping it together. Now, existence of neutrons actually adds strength into the nucleus because neutrons are uh, ne neutral, they're not positive, so they're not really repelled by electrostatic forces. But the strong forces do exist. Strong forces exist between any um, particles inside the nucleus, between, between proton and proton, between proton and neutron, between neutron and neutron. So all these strong forces keep the nucleus together. Well, unless, of course, we bombard the atom, uh, nucle uh, nucleus of the atom with some, some other particles which basically breaks it apart. But that's a different story. Under normal circumstances, strong or nuclear forces keep this nucleus together and uh, basically that's the that's everything I wanted to talk about today yeah one um, one other detail speaking about mass now I was talking about that the whole mass like 99.9% .9 is concentrated in the nucleus now under some circumstances as I was just talking before the nucleus can be broken, like b after bombarding it with some, some particles. The parts will also have certain mass, obviously. Now, well, from uh, our non-relativistic standpoint, the mass of the all pieces into which the nucleus has been broken should be equal to the initial mass of the nucleus. Well, that's not necessarily true. And uh, the reason is that the energy which keeps the uh, nucleus together, uh, according to famous Einstein formula, 
the energy has certain mass and uh, when we break this nucleus using some kind of a outside bombardment or whatever um, we might not have necessarily that the sum of the pieces is equal to the initial mass um, and that's because the energy is involved here energy which keeps it together or energy which breaks them apart etc so there is certain difference between them and we will talk about this um, well atomic bomb actually is built on this formula so to speak but that's a different lecture in some other um, later time so far uh, I just suggest you to read the notes for this lecture so you go to unisor.com choose physics which in course this part is called atoms and within the atoms mm, uh, I think certain topic which is uh, called um, elementary particles and uh, the first lecture in this topic is about main main particles which is electron proton and neutron they are main and we will talk about some others um, well, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.